Before the season started, I determined that there were seven real contenders in basketball. And in my mind, there's varying levels of contention, right? So at the top, you had teams like the Boston Celtics and the OKC Thunder. In the middle, we have a team like the, the Dallas Mavericks and some other teams that are newly constructed, but I thought had the talent pool good enough to potentially put it together, like the 76ers and the New York Knicks. And the last two contenders were teams that I put on the list pretty much out of respect respecting the fact that they have a top three player in basketball and respecting the fact that they've won a championship in recent years. Well, those two teams, the Milwaukee Bucks and the Denver Nuggets are wildly underperforming to start the season. Shout out to the Nuggets. They did squeak out a win against the Toronto Raptors. This video would have been a hundred times more critical if they didn't win that game. But still, there are not a lot of things to be excited about, even with this win. But I want to start out um, with, with the Milwaukee Bucks, again, one and three star is atrocious. They lost the second night of a back to back to the Boston Celtics, which I can't be mad at them at because the Boston Celtics are the greatest team in basketball. And again, second night of a back to back. But you can be mad at that first leg of the back to back when you lose to, to, the, to the Brooklyn Nets. To the Brooklyn Nets, they did that. And the entirety of the Doc Rivers era so far has just been different, right? They had a really good record under Adrian Griffin, regardless of whether or not he was a good coach or not. And as of right now, if I'm not mistaken, Doc Rivers has a negative record with Dame and Giannis on his team. A negative record. Remember, one of the biggest criticisms about Adrian Griffin as a coach is that they had no defensive identity whatsoever. One of the things that they were the worst transition defense team in basketball. And once you look at that, um, they are second to last as of today when it comes to um, how many points per 100 possessions that the team add through transition? They are giving up 7.2 points per 100 possession um, when it comes to transition defense. And overall, we're talking 27th in, in basketball. Um, and that's off turnovers where they're almost the worst in the league. And live balls, they just can't get back and make the right rotations. And I saw this a ton today. I'm still... Uh, completely learning all the X and O's of basketball as I'm trying to be a coach in three years. But like, this is an example of the bad transition defense right here. I mean, Drew Holiday makes an early, early decision to pass it out to Derek White instead of looking towards Jalen Brown. Well, he basically has a two-on-one, which is him and Damian Lillard and Jalen. He passed it out to Derek White, and Derek White gets a little bit of penetration. And as you can see, there's one guy that's not accounted for. Brooke Lopez is slow-footedly getting back on defense. Drew Holiday does a great job of relocating, and he has a wide-open three. That is one of the many, many possessions where they gave up a transition bucket in this game. Here's another example. Now, this is partially Peyton Pritchard being Larry. Gary Bird, but shorter, um, but still transition defense, not the greatest uh, showing. And that, that ended up being a good contest. But again, it's Peyton Pritchard. And when I watched them play, and maybe maybe this is a bad connection, but th this is what's going on in my head when I watched them play. This reminds me so much of the Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, um, Utah Jazz teams. And what do I mean by that? <laughs> it's turned into a Rudy Gobert video, huh? Um, Rudy Gobert was tasked with holding down the defense while he was on a court with four bad perimeter defenders. And the idea when you're playing against the Milwaukee Bucks is just get any form of penetration. And that allows a guy like Brooke Lopez to kind of help because if he doesn't help, then it is an open layup for someone. Um, as you can see right here, Tatum is going to get a step back, give it back up to Drew Holiday. Gary Trent Jr. is supposed to be the stopper that they sign. Again, that's not really his role, but they don't have any other thing. But to give it to Gary Trent Jr., Drew Holiday breaks him down. And as you can see, there's really no option but for Brooke Lopez to overhelp here. And that leads to an open, of course, Al Horford three. And again, it's the greatest three-point shooting team ever constructed. I think it was Giannis, like, just last night when they lost against the Brooklyn Nets, um, basically said that they don't have an identity and I wholeheartedly agree with that and that's on both sides of the ball while you will see a game like today where Damian Lillard gave them 30 and Giannis also gave them 30 I still don't have an idea of what their real game plan is offensively again the Boston Celtics we're gonna create a lot of confusion and find open shots if it's not an open shot it's gonna be a layup cool identity understood and defensively I don't know if they know what they're supposed to do like uh, I remember last year when it was Adrian Griffin, they said that they didn't really understand what the defensive coverage was. Are they going to play drop coverage like they did when they won a championship? Are they bringing Brooke Lopez at slash Bobby Portis to the point? They, they don't know. And I'm watching these last couple games and I'm re-watching the film of the game from last night against Brooklyn. 
they don't have a clue. And the amount of times a guy like Brooke Lopez puts his hands up or pointing towards his teammate is, 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 I don't even know how to explain it. But I think the bigger, bigger picture than all of this, and I don't want to see the comments, okay, Brooke Lopez, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris Middleton comes back and things are going to get better. And they should get, yeah, they should get better when Chris Middleton comes back. But that's, he is not this blanket fix all of these problems type of guy. When they were all on the court together, and I'm talking Dame, Giannis, Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez last season, they had an amazing net rating for sure. But when I watch this team, they just look as, as old and slow as they are. And as we watch these other teams across basketball pretty much evolve to get with the times and get better, I'm watching this team be stuck in their same ways. Even though they upgraded the point guard position offensively, when you compare what they had in Drew Holiday to what Damian Lillard is as an offensive dynamo, they still doesn't feel like much of a difference on the offensive side of the ball. And one thing that bothers me, and, and maybe I'm in the minority here and nobody else really cares about it, is how physical Giannis is, and traditionally, downhill, not a person in the league that can stop that man. When he has a full head of steam, you nor uh, uh, normally just watch defenders say, I don't want no part of that. Go get your bucket, Giannis. But when he doesn't have the ball, he is not physical whatsoever. Giannis is the best in the world at not setting a screen. Not really putting a body on someone. And maybe that is one of the reasons why we don't see the Dame pick and roll red very, very often. Where they would rather elect to have it be Brooke Lopez because Brooke Lopez is a seven foot body that is okay with getting in there and getting that job done. And I think the biggest part about both of these teams is I don't really know what the solution to the problem is. While I don't believe they're going to be a team that's sitting at the the 14 seed all season long, and they'll probably still end up winning close to 50 games. I can't say that as of today, I trust this team to be able to go on the run to win a championship. And if you can't do that with this old roster, with this much money tied into these players, what really is the goal? Now let's move on to the Denver Nuggets. Um, whoa, they they got it. They, they end up winning this game. Um, the Toronto Raptors, young, bad team, no Emmanuel quickly. Um, Scotty Barnes even left this game late in it when he got poked in the eye or something. And Jamal Murray hit a reverse a layup to send it to overtime. And in overtime, they, they took over, which is great. But still, this team is very, very far from the team that I thought we were going to get and very far from the team that was uh, a championship team just two years ago. And I guess the silver line it is for, for us that are neutral, neutral fans here is because this team is basically so bad at this moment. We're going to get to see Nikola Jokic have high 30s, 40-point games every once in a while, or even way more regularly because nobody else in this team is much of a threat. So even today, 40 points, 10 rebounds, four, only four assists. And the game before that versus the Clippers, he turned into a three cola Jokic where it was a three-point rain now because nobody else was willing or capable of shooting. So if there's a silver lining, at least we get to see Big Yoke take over games. But again, we're talking about championship contenders at the end of the day. I've watched this team every single game of their season so far, and this win was so very peculiar. Again, shout out to the Toronto Raptors. They have no business on paper even being in this game. I want to say shout out to Jamal Sheed um, and, and shout out to Jonathan Mo uh, Mogbo, if I'm pronouncing that right. Didn't really get to see them much so far this season, so it was cool to see them get out there. To see a 6'6 center guard of Jokic is kind of funny. Um, so shout out to them for even making this competitive and, and all of that. But again... I know this is like the talking port across all NBA teams going into the season and during the season. Them not having shooting and not having any bench threats whatsoever is the, the detriment to this team. And at one point, we're talking late fourth quarter, they had only attempted, hold on, let me see, I took a screenshot. They had taken 11 threes going into the fourth quarter. 11. For reference, Peyton Pritchard had 12 by himself. This whole team had three quarters of basketball and were afraid to shoot threes. Kenny, maybe the Toronto Raptors did such a phenomenal job of running them off the line, and the Raptors did do a decent job at that. But there were time and time again where a guy like Jamal Murray, who is a pretty good three-point shooter, even though he would prefer to get into the lane slash pull a mid-range jump shot, had an open three and completely decided against shooting it. Like it was something that was said in the meeting before the game, we are just not gonna shoot it. We're gonna play like it is 2007. Give it to our big man and let him cook. And, and again, they won this game, so miraculously it ended up working, but going into the fourth quarter, they were down pretty dramatically. And then in the fourth quarter alone, they took seven. They, they took more than half three-pointers in the fourth quarter, they did the first 
three quarters. It makes no sense. I, I can wholeheartedly say that the Russell Westbrook experiment so far has not gone well, but the people that are acting like the Russell Westbrook thing is the catalyst for all of this, we, we need, are we watching the same hoops? Like, yes, Russ has been bad, but even if he was not playing, this team has not been on the same level as we expected. Like, we always just see the scapegoat, and, and Brody, <laughs> again, he hasn't been good. I'm not defending Russell Westbrook right now, but he is very far from the biggest problem on this team. And I think the biggest problem, and this is just my, I, I don't have the stats to prove any of this. Um, my biggest problem when I watch this is that there's no line of construction that can score if Jokic is not on the court. Looking at the stats right here, the only there's only one lineup that played without Jokic that had a positive net rating, and that, that lineup played a minute and 30 seconds, and it was Jamal Murray, Russell Westbrook, Julian Strother, Peyton Watson, and Aaron Gordon. Um, a minute and 30 seconds total, but every other lineup without Jokic had a negative net rating. And I'll remind you, I mean this with the utmost respect, we're talking about against the Toronto Raptors here. It's a feisty team for sure, but it's the Toronto Raptors. I think there are a lot of people that could be blamed for this slow start. Um, I, I think I would start at the head of the snake and I'm talking about the people that are making the decisions and like the Calvin Booths not really been being open to, to supplying more talent to the roster. Like they have their core four under contract and the core four is pretty good together. In most cases, Jamal, Jokic, Aaron Gordon, and Michael Porter Jr., but outside of that, like even though Christian Brown is having a pretty good season so far, outside of that, it's 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 bones. And I don't mean that literally because they did have bones and they traded him away for nothing. And I mean for good reason. He ain't he's not really a basketball player at this point. Um, but it's a it's a it's a tough watch, but not a tough watch because again, Jokic gets the kill. He took twenty seven shots today. How many times did Jokic take twenty seven shots last season? Four. Four times all season long. And so far this season, three games played, he's done it twice. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Do y'all think that the... So you let me know what you think. Which of the two teams have the higher chance of turning things around? I personally think that that's probably the Nuggets. Uh, but I'm open to all opinions. Link is in the description to the podcast that I host uh, dropping every Friday. Just, just a little plug.